And then in 1990, I was in an apartment where there was a lot of drugs, a lot of guns, um, and these people were being investigated, and it went down. <laughs> Today's guest is Ms. Carmen Arroyo, the Senior Director of Exodus Transitional Community ATI Building. And what is the ATI Building? Alternative to incarceration. incarceration. There we go. Yes. So Carmen, you know, Carmen run things around here. So we, we get ready to get into her business, you know? Yeah. And we have, our, we have her here today, which is uh, beautiful. And we appreciate you coming. Making me and we're looking forward. We're looking forward to uh, getting into your business yeah. and see how yeah. things is yeah. with you. So um, I have beside me my co-host, Mr. Anthony Cologne. You already know who I am. Already know. You know? How, how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> and we just been looking for this moment, waiting for this moment. And so, um, any questions? Yes, so as we're here at Exodus Production Studio, again, celebrating our second annual um, podcast show with Miss Carmen. So let, let's break it down, what it is that she do, where she come from. We're going to get into a little business and why she does what she does um, and how we give back to the community. So, Carmen, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Mama. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us a little about yourself. Tell me about what was it like you growing up. I know you grew up in Puerto Rico, right? So actually, I was born in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. um, Campesina. Both of my parents are from Puerto Rico. And um, we migrated here when I was about one. And I've um, been here ever since. Uh, my mom and my dad separated when I was about 10 years old. So my mom was a single mom, raising me, my brother, and my two sisters. So that was really difficult for her. And um, she was not your conventional mom, right? It was like, do what I say, when I say, and that's it. Um, at that time, when I was a teenager, I didn't understand um, what she was going through. She was always tired. She worked two jobs. Um, when she was coming in, we were getting up to go to school. So I didn't really have like that type of um, attention that, you know, as a mother, I felt she should have given me. So um, at... 15 or 16, I was like, I want to hang out. I want to be with my friends, you know. I want to go downstairs and be part of the party that they're having in the park. Yeah. And she would say no to me, you know, and I was always, like, yelling and screaming and crying. My next-door neighbor, who was my childhood sweetheart, we went to school okay. together in high school, and, of course, you know, I was in love, head over heels. Um, at 17, I um, had a, became pregnant, and my mom was like, oh, no, you're out of here. And, um, of course, I went to live with him, and mom was right. The worst decision I made of my life. Yeah. Um, you know, he was very abusive. Um, in the 80s, they were using crack and putting it in, rolling it in the woolies, I think it was yeah. called, the woolies. The wo woolies, that's um, right. Yeah, so I was part of, you know, being, being abused by him. Um, I lived with him and his mom, and even though his mom always tried to protect me, you know, when she wasn't around, that's when he would come upset and, you know, try to take my money. At that time, <laughs> at that time, I remember they had the food stamps. It was the card, yeah. the little food stamp, that's the right. five, dollars bills, right? And, um, you know, he would take it from me. He would get angry if I wouldn't give it to him. If I bought stuff for the baby, he would sell it. So it was really hard for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day, I... Um, you know, found myself with two black eyes and a broken nose. And um, I said, if I stay here, he's going to abuse me and this baby. So I went back and I begged my mom for forgiveness and I begged her to take me back and she mm -hmm. took me back. And it was with the terms of you stay away from him, you know, you can't be in his life or whatever. Um, and that's what happened. But then, you know, it was never enough. I was working. It was never enough. I wanted my own apartment. They can be two queens in one castle. And that Absolutely. was my mother's castle, right? And, you know, on top of going to school, on top of taking care of the baby, I had to work. And, you know, I still was 18 now. I still wanted to hang out. Oh, I still yeah. wanted to have fun. Absolutely. And my mom would always tell me, I told you. Didn't I tell you, don't, Carmen, don't, you know? And I guess maybe 
she was giving me the right message, but it was the way she was giving me the message. Delivering it. Right. Delivering. I was like, oh, God, why? You know, you don't know everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I met some people, and they were like, you're cute, you're young. We're going to have you take stuff for us and, and carry it, and we're going to give you $1,000 per package. And when I heard $1,000, I was like, what? Shit, yeah. I'm good. I'm getting an apartment. I'm gonna get a babysitter. My son is gonna have everything that he could ever have that I could never give him, you know, mm -hmm. at a nine to five job working in a supermarket. Um, and I did that for about two years. And then in 1990, I was in an apartment where there was a lot of drugs, a lot of guns, um, and these people were being investigated. And it went down. ATF knocked down those doors. I was there. The drugs were visible, the guns were visible, um, mm. and they took us. And I went down, I was at 150 Park Road. And, um, you know, yeah. when we're in trouble, that's when we call out to God, right? Uh -huh. That's right, yeah, absolutely. Oh my God, God, I believe in you, God, I love you, God. If you take me out of this predicament, they were talking about 15 years. They were following these people, mm -hmm. they had pictures, they had everything. Um, you know, and it's crazy because when I sat down, and they were asking me questions. Um, one of the lady um, detectives, um, she goes, you're never gonna see your son unless you tell us you know, what this is about. Yeah, obviously is none of that was yours or whatever. I said, I was just visiting my friend. She told me to go pick her up. Mm -hmm. She's like, I don't believe that shit, you know, coming mm -hmm. at me, threatening me with my son. And there was a little bit of nervousness in me that I was like, hmm. Yeah. I do know what's going on. I do know, you know, what's happening. But then I'm like, wait a minute, there's that fear if I say something. You know, these people know where I hang out. They supposedly friends of mine. Nah. Right. I stick to what I stuck. I don't know nothing. Absolutely. That's it. I don't know nothing. Um, so I was there on the second day. Um, we go and we see um, the judge. But it was, in a, it was not even a courtroom. It was like a room where they sit you down. They have the ADA, they have your lawyer, they have a judge, and I was by myself. Mm. So my lawyer, he was this white guy, really tall and intimidating looking. I thought he was actually the DA, right? Yeah. And um, he's talking to me and he says, look, God is by your side because what they told us was that you don't know anything and you were there visiting somebody. If a person's body, I mean, my, my body just started shaking, and I'm sorry, I thought I was going to use the bathroom on myself. Mm -hmm. Because just to hear this, prior to hearing, you're going to do 15 years, you're not going to see your son. Yeah. Right? And that night before, I was on my knees. My knees were red because I was praying to God. I said, God, if you get me out of this predicament, I would never in my life, ever look at drugs again or touch a gun again or do any of this. Absolutely. And thank God, um, they let me go. They gave me six months of probation. And I was going to see this lady um, every other week downtown. And I had to get a job. I had to remain drug free. They were drug testing me. Um, they would go visit my house, which, was, which my mom hated. You know, my mom was like, she wanted to kill me. Um, <laughs> you know, she, she wanted to kill me. Like, why? Yeah. You know, because she worked hard. And she was trying to, you know, instill that in me. You know, like, Carmen, you have to work hard. Nothing is going to come easy. And I just wanted the fast life. And I wanted what my friends were having, you know. I wanted their clothing. And I wanted to give everything to my son. And I didn't know, like, okay, you have to work hard to get that the right way, right? right. And not have to look over your shoulder. Um, I never looked back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, hey, great for you. That, that is amazing. Sometimes a person got to hit their head a couple of times before they realize that. What are some of the influences that you had growing up? Anybody in your life that, like, positive influence in your life that, like, made you after that experience? I know it was a traumatic experience. But, like, did you, like, have anybody in your corner that you say, you know what, like, I know this person is doing the right thing. Like, I, I, I got to look up to this person. Is that anybody? I mean, you know, besides my mom, that she was always working and coming home and being tired. But I didn't want to be that person, right? right. Because I didn't want to always come home and be tired mm -hmm. and, and then have what to show for it, right? Besides, she paid the bills and kept clothes on our backs, right? So in terms of looking at her 
that she provided, you know, for us to live comfortably, I, I looked up to that, right? But I always wanted more and I was in the projects, right? So who was I gonna look up to? besides the drug dealers that were there in the corner. Yeah. You know, I was raised in Washington houses. That's right there on 104. Wow. So I've always lived there. I've always known that community. I yeah. still live there, but now I live on Lexington, not in the projects, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay. So um, that's, so, so my question was like, that, that sound like just, just that whole experience with you going through uh, uh, the incarcerated part it was like that pivotal moment for you. And, and, could you just expound on the first day? Just was that how was that that first day like in there? Just being, you know, having them around you, asking questions, all of that. How was that experience like it for was, you? How how did it feel? <laughs> Listen, if you can remember, I I thought you know in my head that. I'm good. I can handle anything. You know, because when you when when you talk to people and you meet people and they're like, listen, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. But if you ever get stopped by the police or whatever, you got to just, you know, maintain your silence like you can't fold under pressure. Right. right. And like I said, I was two point five seconds away from folding. Right. Because when they use your child as a tool against mm -hmm. you, you're like, shit, like I'm going to get football numbers. I'm never going to see my kid. Right. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, wait a minute. And then when you actually walking down that cold ass freaking hallway and, right. you know, they telling you like, hurry up and they cursing at you, mm. you know, hurry up, hurry up and do this and take your clothes off. And for me to like, I've always been a person that, you know, I'm very outgoing, I'm friendly or whatever, but I'm very shy when it comes like to my body. And when they were like, take your clothes off now, I'm like, what? And one mm. of the guards was actually telling me, oh, you real slim and pretty. Oh, you got long hair. You're in trouble here. I don't know if that was their way of intimidating me. Mm -hmm. You know what? Like whatever was going on, but I was freaking scared. Like I said, I'm never a god. Please, I'm never gonna do this. I don't think that I was even talking a language that they were understanding, because I wasn't even understanding myself. And let me tell you, every time I got a job and they would ask me on the application. Have you ever, you know, been incarcerated? Have you ever been convicted of a crime or whatever? I would always say no. Mm. And nothing would ever show up on my records, right? Mm. Which is crazy. Now, two years ago, we went to Dippy Kill. And that same year, I was going through some boxes in my apartment. And I found the slip from the federal court, right? You have completed your probation, blah, 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 whatever. Right. So Julio told me, Carmen, if you're going to hire in your department, you have to make sure that, you know, there's a balance, right? Um, and he didn't, but I said, Julio, I, 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 I have been impacted by the justice system. He was like, no, you haven't. I said, yeah, I did two days in the feds. <laughs> and he right. didn't believe it. But can I tell you guys that my trauma was like, I That's blocked right. that shit yeah. on my mind. Yeah, I really believe that I never did a day in prison right. until I found that paper that I was looking for and I took it to Dippy Kill and Julio saw it and he was like, yo, I can't believe it. And I said, I've been lying in all my job applications. That's why it seems to me that that was like that pivotal moment yes. for you. That was yeah. a really pivotal yes. moment Yes, listen. Mm -hmm. Listen, I... You know they say like karma comes knocking on your door no matter where you move it knows your address and i'm gonna tell you eric i did so much damage to people by selling them drugs right um absolutely that it's is very scary absolutely take your time because mm -hmm. you, you know and and since you said that you know that's that's me too as well so that's my background as well I, I sold drugs from the age of 12 to 20 years old and that's all i knew you know um until i received 25 years to life right and and i took a different path in life and the path that i take now is that i would never you know with the with the growth and development that we go through as as humans we, you know we know that we would never have did that to our community yeah if we known what we know now, yeah. you know, so I definitely, I definitely feel, you know, everything that you 
you feeling right yeah. now? Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. It's growth and development, looking back on retrospect, right, on, on what we did to our community, right? And I think that's why we're all here today, yeah. right? You know, doing what we're doing, playing our part in this society, in our community, right? And how can we start changing the way people not only view us, right, but how we can start changing the lives and put, put in some more guidance, right? When I ask that question, and I have to ask myself the same question, who did I have to look up to when I was growing up? Eric. <laughs> Eric gave me my first pack of drugs to go take out of town. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I look at us here now. Right? Yeah. So, but today we can change that through our experience. Absolutely. Right? We give back to our community. We go preach to some of these young, young adults out there nowadays. And some of these older adults that still have the same mentality as these younger adults, right? That it doesn't matter. They just want to stack those chips. They just want to get that money. They just want to get through all that. They don't really take into account who they're affecting, who they hurt, who they're killing, right? And when that ball drops, then nobody really wants to do the time. Yep. Nobody wants to take accountability. Nobody wants to be responsible, right? But yet everybody wants the big house. They want the nice apartment. They want the nice car. They want the nice jewelry. They want to be the man in the street or the woman in the street. When it's time to go face that judge, ah. Right. And at the end of the day, you know, we not make, I wasn't making the millions. I didn't have the big house. I was just, you know, making it. I was just providing for me and my son. It was not like I was making a million dollars or I'm going to go buy a house, I'm going to go do this. I was still living with my mother. I was just living better than I was prior to that, right? But it was not worth 15 years of my life. It was not worth me, you know, selling drugs to some people that I even knew that, you know, after a while they became heavy drug addicts, you know. Um, Yeah, and that was... And and, and so that's what I want to know. When you got that, what, what was the moment that you got that? That you that because you were real emotional mm-hmm. when you speak about selling drugs to the community, mm-hmm. you know, and and you know knowing the effects that it caused. So when did you get that as as a, a person? Like so, my daughter Darian, she's twenty nine, um, and I had a, a best friend. Her name was Lulu. So my daughter's middle name is Lulu. I named her after um, my best friend. Yes. Okay. And um, she threw herself off the roof in Washington projects. Wow. She was high on drugs. I, I didn't sell her drugs. You know, this was after that. This was after I got out of that. And yeah. I would see her and I would say, yo, Lou, like, you know, what's up? Like, get your shit together. You know, it's not, it's never too late or whatever. But she was so wrapped up in it. Um, yeah, and one morning we got the call that she threw herself off the roof. She was high. Wow. And, and, and I think it was dust or something lost like hope. that. She lost hope. Right. Right, so my daughter's middle name in her birth certificate is Lulu. I named her after that. And her dad's name is Louis, too. So, you know, it was kind of like, okay, he wanted Louisa, I wanted Lulu. Um, But yeah, so that was the moment when I was like, shit, you know, like, what are we doing? What are we doing to our communities, right? Because we're doing it here. We're not doing it no place else, right? And it's like, you know, and then family members, you know, getting hooked on drugs and having to go through this, um, you know, and, and I'm actually going through a battle right now with my own son. And this is why I say that when karma comes knocking on that fucking door, whether uh-huh. you want to open it or not, remember me. You did this to your community. I'm here for you now. What's up? Absolutely. What you going to say? Absol- right? A- absolutely. Right? Accountability, responsibility. I, yeah. I, I can sit here. We can talk hours on that. I, I, trust me. One thing I've That's learned. Right. One thing that I've learned, right, as, as a person in this journey that served over 22 years in and out of prison, who has been addicted to drugs, right, that, thing, that I had to learn to forgive myself first and foremost, right, because that's, right. that's what you have to get the growth at, to forgive yourself and not allowing a person to hold your path to your future, you know. And, yeah, we answer those doors. We have to, right? And sometimes it's not the greatest person that we want to, but we have to take into consideration they feelings how we affected them in a negative way, right? And let them get what they need to get off their chest in order for their growth and development. And that's the hard part is because we don't want to accept that, yeah. right? And when I'm talking to you and like you, you came in here into this room with, with a lot of energy, like you can just tell like you're a down earth person, like you just a very connected person. And so when, when I'm talking to you and I'm looking at what you've been through in your experience of two days, right? What made you get into this life now that you're living? To, to be a part of something 
that helps formerly incarcerated men and women get their life together. It helps the community. That yes. helps the community. Well, Actually helps society as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, my son at an early age, he was arrested. And um, he did some time. And I felt so helpless as a, you know, Latina without that type of money to bail him out to get a private lawyer, right? Yeah. And he had to do a one, two, three. And now that I've been doing this for 19 years, my son would have not had to do one day if his lawyer would have freaking spoke up for him, if his lawyer would have advocated the way he should have, mm -hmm. right? And if I would have had resources to help me help my son. Right. So he had to do the time. And then while he was in jail, a one, two, three turned into seven years because somebody tried to, you know, abuse him in there and he had to, right, um, do what he had to do. So... I said to myself, I'm not ever going to be that person again. I will help any parent, any human being that comes mm -hmm. for help. So I had to just, you know, get in there and educate myself. Um, I worked in a school as a parent coordinator where parents would come and talk to me and tell me, like, hey, you know, I have the situation with my son. Can you help me or with my daughter or whatever? And even when a, even when a kid is in school, right, it starts from school, um, you know, we lose a lot of kids. They fall between the cracks. Because yes. if you're not a parent that you're active and you're there for your kids and you're just throwing them into school, like, oh, from 8 to 3, they belong to the school. That's BS. You have to be there. You have to be active. You know, so starting from there when I worked in the school, um, helping parents. And then I said, wow, like, I really like this. Then when I started working for Senator Serrano, you know, as the constituent coordinator, he actually... He actually would always tell me, like, I want you to meet with the constituents no more than 25 minutes. But I would sit there, and I would get them resources, and I would make phone calls, and I would do all these things for them yes, that were out of my job description, right? Mm -hmm. But again, how can I turn somebody away who's coming to me? Yeah, and, and well over 25 shoes, minutes. Right? right? <laughs> and I was in their shoes, and she's telling me, I have a legal aid lawyer for my son. He's facing, you know, 18 years or whatever for something that he says he didn't do. What should I do? My lawyer's not advocating. My lawyer's not, you know, helping us. Right. And when that when those things will happen or when people would tell me, you don't know what it's like. I know what it's like. I was there. I was that parent. Don't That's tell right. me I don't know what it's like. That's right. 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 That's why I'm going hard body for that. That's and right. then um, after being with the senator for three and a half years, it was just fluff. I wasn't really making a difference in my community. And I lived in that community. He had this building in that community. And then one day I said, you know what? There has to be something more that I could do to help, like in a way that I'm going to see a difference in my community. And that's when I applied for um, Andrew Glover. They had a job posting for a court advocate. I didn't know shit about the courts, right? Mm -hmm. But what I experienced, well, that's that we right. get mistreated, that they don't provide us with services, that if we don't have a paid lawyer, we're going to jail. Right. Right, that's all I knew. Right, Absolutely. And that I got a big mouth, and I'm going to talk, and I'm going to ask questions. That's, that's right. That's it. So um, can you explain a little bit, um, just expound a little bit on um, just your position um, in the ATI department, what the ATI does, and you know how how y'all give back to the. You know, I don't do nothing well, when I'm there. They just make me look good. <laughs> <laughs> the no, team, no, the you, team, the team does all the work. The team does all the work. Let me out. The team does all the work. Um, you know, ATI is alternative to incarceration. And um, it's funny because when I, when I, when Julio knew that I wanted to work for Exodus, because I know it's an amazing organization, and I followed him for years and years and years. Um, when he told me that they were going to open a position for alternatives to incarceration, and I was already doing that 13 years in the courthouse, you know, he knew that I came with that experience Absolutely. and that Rolodex. Um, and he was like, when I get that grant, Carmen, because I'm going to get it, I'm bringing you on board. I said, call me when you're ready. And he did. He called me when I was in Puerto Rico. Wow. And Absolutely. I came, and I've been doing it, and I love it. And we work with um, females and males 18 and older. They can be 18 and 100 years old misdemeanors, felonies, attempted murder, gun charges, anything and everything that you can imagine. Um, I have two amazing court advocates, Robert Harris and um, Will Steele. I have an amazing- Big shout advocate. out to Will and Rob. So. Yes, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. yes. Today's Rob's birthday. Um, I, I, I have birthday, an amazing Rob. assistant program director who is Johnny Jara. He's my left and right hand man. Um, he was still working in the courthouse and I called him, offered him the position and he came down. Um, he's passionate for what he does. Um, the whole team, my case managers, they sit there, they make sure that they meet with the participant, that 
So there was a time where we wasn't servicing females. I mean, we weren't getting the numbers, right? right. Um, I was only allowed to service males. That's, that's the grant that they wrote, only for males, right? Okay. And females would come, and I would sit with them and still do an intake and still call the lawyers and still go for them to court. Absolutely. And they're like, but you're not getting those numbers. Like, we can't use them as numbers. I'm like, so what? Right. I'm not going to turn them away because I can't use them on my report. Damn it. Like, they need the help. We got to do this. Absolutely. Passion and purpose. That, that, yeah. That passion and, and purpose. And so you know you'll be wrong if you don't shout out Olga and Michael. So let's see. Come on, that's why I said I got amazing, I got amazing case managers. Listen, shout out Johnny. Shout out Johnny. I did. I said Johnny Johnny. 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 Come on now, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, guess what? We're, we're here to provide a service. And like I said, we don't turn anybody away. Um, the calls that get me are the mothers, right? My Absolutely. son is in prison, you know, is a mother. She's 70 years old, crying for her kid, 30-something years old, mm -hmm. attempted murder, right? I'll talk to her. I'll get her information. I got to call the lawyer first and see what the lawyer's thinking of doing or whatever. Um, but those are the calls that really break my heart, right? Absolutely. Because, again, we come from a society that if you don't got that money to pay for that private lawyer, mm -hmm. you're in some deep trouble. That's right. Absolutely. Very deep trouble. And, and so I just, I just want to say, like, so, so I have a really uh, deep relationship with Michael. Right, and Michael shares the insight of ATI and in that family. And from just my experience on on seeing y'all and and seeing how you know comfortable y'all are with working together, that's like I think that goes a long way with helping the community and giving back to the community. So just if you could give like some advice to those men and women that's coming home from prison, what kind of advice you would give to someone, you know, a along with your services, understandable, but you know, that advice that's about to come home for men and women. So if they're about to come home, right? If you have a, if you have a, um, a support system, Right, it, it makes it better when you have a support makes system. Makes a difference, yes. But when you don't have a support system and you have to come out and you, you know, are gonna be considered homeless, right? And now all these new laws have changed. You have to be three months homeless in order to be considered homeless mm -hmm. and get a shelter. I mean, it's crazy. Well, How absolutely. can we freaking survive Especially when we come home <laughs> without a support system, right? And then they're telling you, do this, do that, go here, go there, right? I would say, you know, try to stay strong, try to reach out um, to people, try to um, definitely go to agencies that you know that are out there. Um, but I want to say, right, when you come home, mm -hmm. you're not coming home to what you left, right? You're not. Because Absolutely. your husband could be coming home to you after 17 years. And Change. the wife is different and the husband is different. Because whatever trauma he went through in there or whatever trauma she went through in there, and now she's coming home to her husband, right? He's different, she's different. I advise them to get therapy, go to counseling, mm -hmm. you know, go to counseling with your family. Because yeah. it's not, you're not coming back to the same thing. You're not coming back to the same community. You know, people came home from prison that they didn't even know how to swipe a Metro card. They went in when it was the tokens, <laughs> right? The phones, the phones. Swipe like, what am I doing here yeah. with this phone, yeah. right? Um, it's just... It's, it's not easy. I'm not going to say it's easy because it's not going to be easy, especially, again, if you don't have a support system when you come home. That's right. That's right? good sound advice there. So, and, and just saying that. Also, and don't give up. That's right. Right. And the so, doors are going to keep closing on you. Keep knocking on those doors. Right. The door closed, climb through the freaking window. I'm that's here. That's right. And so we know trauma comes in all different components. Of course. You know what I mean? And of so course. those individuals, men and women that's coming home, definitely have that trauma that component and as well as the family that never been to prison they have a lot of trauma that goes on and they experience in life through their journey whatever that journey they they going through in life so we got both components to to, to work of on and that, and that was sound advice or you know you got men did. that go in when there's child for example michael is five years old 
and you coming home to a 30 year old grown ass man what's right. that like what's that like right like right. you're trying to fit in he's trying to fit in with you you're trying to fit in with him it's freaking hard it's freaking very very hard Absolutely. you know and we Absolutely. do have to support one another and we do need more programs like Exodus and we do need more people to get, you know, educated when it comes to the trauma, right? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to triggers because I might be talking to you and you might be cool with me saying, I, I don't know, I was talking to the guys and I said, I'm going to go walk the yard with Johnny, right? And they were like, no, you can't use that word. It's, and they told me it's another word. Walk the yard means you're going to like fight with him. Mm. I, I, I think they said spin the yard, right? Yeah, spin, the yard. spin the yard is talking to Johnny, right? Yeah, yeah. They thought they were like on a level one. They were like, oh shit, level one? Yeah. You're gonna go fight with Johnny? So, you know, things like that, that, you know, I didn't get to, I didn't get to go and experience that, right? And I was one of the fortunate ones. Um, Cause they could have went left. And I could have been sitting here telling you I did 15 years, I was abused in prison, you know, this is what I went through, I didn't have my family support. My mom didn't even speak English, so if I would have been doing 15 years, I don't know how she would have found me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is your hope for the ATI program, for brothers and sisters that's misguided out there? and what you can do for your community. So right now, um, our contract week of service, 90 individuals, we're way beyond that. And we're not stopping. We're not closing our doors, like I said, to anybody. My hope is to have an ATI in Poughkeepsie, an ATI in Newburgh, an ATI in Florida, an ATI wherever we could go, right? Because this service isn't needed. Again, you have people getting arrested and doing time for BS. But BS, because they don't have anybody to advocate for them. Let me tell you something. I think we sat maybe in 10 proffers, right, with district attorneys. And out of that, out of 10, eight or seven have been successful. No jail time. People that were looking at 12 years. I got a guy that was looking at 12 years. He got a year ATI program. Who does that? Where they do that? Back in the days, you don't have that. And that's because you have people now that are advocating, that are speaking up, that know stuff. Yeah, where was y'all when I was out there getting high and getting locked up and needed someone to come advocate and say, Your Honor, he needs a drug program. He doesn't need prison. Where was you? Nah. I was fucked up. Sure. That's right. We I, I, I was, we was going through. Hey, I was not there. I apologize. But to the beautiful that thing is help. that you're here now. Yes. And you're making a difference. You yes. know? And that's the most important thing. That you're out here and you're making a difference. And I truly believe that no great work goes without a great team. That's right. Got to have a great team. Yeah. That's why I said I don't do it. They do it. The yeah. community, our family. That's, that's my family. I spend more time with them than I even do with my own family. Yeah. Um, you know, from Michael, who's my lead facilitator. Michael is my go-to dude, man. I say, Michael, I him. need this. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell <laughs> Michael tonight. To Mike. <laughs> yes, Mike, Mr. Marshall. I sent him a message tonight. Like, I need a curriculum on gun violence. It's on my table before I walk in in the morning. That's I'm like, right. dude, you, what happened? He's so freaking he's dedicated. No, he's, dedicated. he's dedicated. He's so passionate. He's... And he's a pussycat, man. Don't tell yeah. him I said that, though. Yeah. Wait, can we erase that? Nope. He's nope. a pussycat. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, he's, 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 he's so good. He's so humble, you know. Um, like, I love him. Like, I love Michael to death. I love him. I love the entire team, um, you know, and, and they go above and beyond, and they fighters. Like, I have Mr. Steele who goes up and approaches the bench, man. We got pictures of him standing in front of a judge and a DA. And like he tells me, I would have never thought this. Mm. Bilal. Yeah. Bilal Lewis sat That's in right. front of a district attorney mm. to advocate on behalf Shout of a participant. Yeah. And you know what he tells me? He goes, boss, I would have never in my life thought that I was going to be sitting across from a district attorney telling them about a participant and trying to save another person's life, not to have to do jail time. Yeah, so That's I, freaking I, big. So I did my part. I got everybody except Olga. You need to get Olga in there now. Yeah. August, so my senior. <laughs> August, my, listen. Olga, yeah. So listen, Olga comes from working in a hospital for over 20-something years. And when I offered her the position, she was not working. Um, she goes, ah, I don't know, I mean, whatever, da-da-da. She's 
amazing. Excellent. Yes. Like, I can't even <laughs> tell you how amazing she is. She could be any other place. They offer her another job in the hospital. She didn't take it. Making more money. Okay? She was like, no, I'm going to stay here. And she's amazing. She calls the client. She sees the client. She visits the clients in the hospital. I have Will Sanchez who goes at 7 o'clock in the morning to take these participants to get evaluations. Yeah. Come on, do where they do that? There's no other ATI. I yeah. don't care what ATI yeah. you know. Yeah. There's no other ATI that does what Exodus ATI does. And we're going to continue to do it. Yeah, I mean, what what's being done here at Exodus is, is literally second to none. It's just amazing what Julio Medina's vision to create. And I think for all formerly incarcerated men and women, no matter where they are in their life, you know, when, when you start to find your passion and your purpose, it's not a job. No. That's right. It's, no. Not, it's not a no. job. It's literally living no. your life and your purpose. You love to do what you do. Like I work with people with mental health illnesses. I have people go, how do you have and deal with so many residents? And I go, it's not work for me. Right. That's right. It's not work for me. Yeah, no. It's like, it, it, it's the greatest thing like is my purpose you gotta love it and she just didn't mention one more person huh? that she should have oh. mentioned the brandon <laughs> not only brandon who in here with us that, who's in this, in this room johnny. with us <laughs> i said johnny i said my <laughs> assistant director <laughs> of course like, like just like, making sure you me. Every, he'll I'm he'll making sure tomorrow. I got everybody. But <laughs> can, 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 real quick, right? We're about to wrap it up, but let's give some a quick advice, right? For those formerly incarcerated men and women, right, that mm -hmm. comes out of jail, wants to go for a job interview, right? Can you give them a quick synopsis on proper etiquette on what not to do and what to do <laughs> when they're going for a freaking job? This so, is good. Right. So I don't care what what year we're in, what, what year we're in, right? 2023. Where I come from, you still wear a suit, you still wear a white shirt, you still wear a tie. Mm. If you're a female, you don't wear bangle earrings, you don't wear red lipstick, right? You don't go in there uh, chopping your bubble gum. No. <laughs> right? Because you have to, That's you know, right. you, you're you selling yourself basically to why they should hire you. Especially if you don't have a degree, right? That's why right. should they hire you instead of the 10 people that are outside that have masters and bachelors and all this other crap? Right. But for me, it's very important to have the gentleman come with a shirt and a tie and a blazer. You know, very appropriate for a job interview. Um, the young ladies with a suit, if it's a skirt suit, even better. You look very professional. Don't go in there and keep looking at your watch, trying to tell the interviewer how long is this interview? I gotta go someplace else, yeah. right? Yeah. And know your shit, right? Yeah. Know what you're going for. Yeah. Don't sit there and say, "Well, when do I start baking the fries?" Like, right. uh, what? This ain't Burger King. You right. know, some people just go because they want an interview, and that's right. fine, right? right. But know what you're going. Do a little bit of research on the organization. You just hit it right there, the nail on the head, right there. I yeah. tell people that all the time. Before you go into an interview, do some research. Google of the course. company, what it is that you're doing, what the position, what it entitles into that position. Go there and sell yourself. I tell people as a formerly incarcerated man, I have to work twice as hard as your average person with a degree. As a formerly incarcerated you're me man. I'm a female. Yeah. As, I work twice as hard. <laughs> twice as hard, right? That's as, as a formerly incarcerated individual, let's put that right, as individual, right? I tell people I got twice as more to prove to you than the average person. But let me tell you why the reason why you should hire me. Because I'm going to work twice as hard as the person with the freaking degree. Right. Right. That's simple. Right. Presentation. Right. Is that what you're going to do? You know, for me, I don't understand. For me, I, I, I'm not going to do nothing with a degree. I, I can't do nothing with that plaque that you have on your wall. Yeah, if you I'm don't sorry. have the experience, I don't want that. I want experience. I want somebody that's hungry, somebody that'll be the first one in, the last one out, and have that experience. That's right? right? Mm -hmm. And be empathetic when you're working with participants. Presentation and preparation. We. <laughs> yeah. Come in, come into you know, I interviews. asked somebody, what, what does they, so what do you know about ATI? Uh, I don't know. Um, you guys get people out of jail. <laughs> what does ATI stand for? Uh, always uh, tacos, ice. I don't know. Yeah. Like yo, dude. Inside like theft corporation. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know, dude. Um, you know, but it's really important when you go to a job interview, sell yourself. You know, and, and be humble. Know Absolutely. your stuff. You know, be and passive stop. aggressive. And don't right? look at your watch. 
<laughs> and don't look at your watch, dude. Yeah. If you're hearing me, you... anyway. Um, he was actually hired by Exodus. He was. He was working in one of the hotels. And he was really a nice guy, right? right. But again, yeah. nobody prepared him for that, right. right? Nobody prepared him. And I'm sure he told people he was going for a job interview. Oh, yeah. He was probably going to another job interview for Exodus in a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> I think also he was nervous. Sometimes people, you know, like they start looking at their watch or they start to smile. I had a participant that he was in front of the judge and the judge was like, you know, you could be facing 18 years. And he starts laughing and smiling and the judge goes, is this funny to you? And I'm like, your honor, that's kind of like his defense mechanism mm, when yeah. he gets nervous that's mm. what happens right right so i don't know maybe he was nervous that's why he kept looking right. at his watch okay well, so, so i just want to thank you again, thank you Colin. thank you for listening look, look, to you me. know i've been waiting for you we've been was waiting it worth for the you wait? Oh, of course and more. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and and appreciate everything just no, from the listen, heart i we appreciate, appreciate you guys because you know um, I know now a million of my friends are going to hear this and see that I put my ugly face to cry. They're going to be uh, like, my daughter, my daughter has this thing. She goes, oh, my, you was crying so ugly. So, <laughs> she you know, me. and then yeah. I mentioned her, Lulu, was, so I gave her genuine. a shout out. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, um, it was genuine, you know, and like I said, it's not, it's not freaking easy, especially when you have to prove yourself, right? Especially when you already have that label. That person, you know, used to sell drugs or that person, you know, did X, Y, and Z. Like, do we trust them? Do we trust them around, you know, our participants? Do we trust mm -hmm. them in this community? Mm -hmm. And it's basically like we just have to continue to prove ourselves over and over and over. So I want to, like, clone 50 Julios, right, and send them all over so that we can have more ATIs. Because I listen to stories where people tell me that they had to do, you know, eight months in prison for some time. For something yeah. that they would have got, a CD. Absolutely. That's it, nothing. And we want to clone 20 uh, comments, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, <laughs> and let yes, me know. Sir. And I will say, for the record, you are natural. Don't stop. Look, you come in here front and like, I'm done. You I are am nervous. natural. Well, I did mention I <laughs> to somebody, I think it was Michael, that I wanted to do an ATI podcast. And have people talk about their experiences and what they're going through, you know, and what, what it looks like for them, um, you know, in the future. Are they going to have to do jail time? And also have some of the success stories that have been already through ATI Exodus. Absolutely. We just had a graduation in um, the ATI part in 100th Center Street. If you have any advice for anyone out there, what would it be? Don't be a fool. Stay in school. <laughs> That's right. Um, no, you know, just... just Things are going to get hard, right? Um, don't give up, right? Sometimes you think that there's only one road. There's going to be other roads. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's... For me, when, if, I, if I had to do this again, I would have did it. Because this is what made me who I am today, right? This is who mm -hmm. made me who I am today. I don't take no shit. Um, I don't give no shit either, right? I treat people the way I want to be treated. Um, I go hard for what I believe in. Um... And I'm passionate about what I do, um, you know, and it's not easy. This is not an easy world. And sometimes people, when they feel like it's getting harder, they want to give up. Like, mm -hmm. don't give up. Call me. I'm here for you. 917-492-0990, right. extension 192. Oh, she ah, put the plug. That was the plug, y'all. That, right that, that was the plug. That was the plug. For all those that want to get in touch with us, they can always over, uh, what is it? Success after, after lockdown, lockdown on G2, gmail.com, gmail Anchor, Spotify, Apple Music. We everywhere. Mm. Nice. Facebook, Instagram. So with that being said, thank you, Carmen, for coming out. Thank you for having me. Thank you, you, the the ADI thank you. for what y'all do, for Johnny for coming out. You know, for everyone that's involved in doing something, man, to change the course of someone's life that has been misguided. Like, yo, round of applause for all of us. That's cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. With that being said, y'all know the song, Brooklyn, we go hard, but uh, today is <laughs> Harlem, she goes hard, she goes uh, hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank With you. that being said, take care, God bless. 2023, we here, baby. I drink to that, I drink to that. I drink to that. I drink to that, me too. <laughs>